so welcome to Joe Billingsley, Billingsley Barbecue. You know that's why we're here, right? Yeah. So uh, I go back a long way with Joe, sitting in Thayer Hotel at West Point after the Army Cyber Institute just been opened. Joe and I are having dinner with General Hernandez. It's a true story. He hands me a white paper called MCPA. He said, I'm going to put this organization together. And here we are. A plan works. And one of the reasons we're here today within cybersecurity is because plans are working, but they aren't working in all the ways we need them to be. Okay? I have the privilege of sitting on the Solarium Commission as a senior advisor, been engaged in it since October 2019. And I would tell you that a set of plans that are underway are working, but there are gaps. There are things that are missing. And as you may have heard from the rather forthright discussion this morning from General Alexander, who laid it out very clearly for us. We're at war, China is our enemy, and they're getting ready to invade Taiwan. And what separates us from defeat is the cyber vector. If we get it right, we will win. If we don't, it's over. All right, and I always tell people, if we don't get it right, we're gonna better be printing Chinese dictionaries. So over the last few months, let me talk about our victories. We've had some. Solarium Commission set the groundwork established a frame which led to the Office of the National Cyber Director, led initially by my dear friend Chris Inglis, most of you know him, a true great leader. He built that office from scratch, and to quote Mark Montgomery, my boss in the Solarium Commission, he says nobody should ever do a startup, let alone a startup inside the White House. Chris got it right. The people there are enthused, they are driven, and they are bringing solutions to the table. They issued the National Cyber Strategy in March, Another win, not perfect, but a good document. Another framework for our success. Doesn't mean it's perfect. We all need to gather around it and take it to its next level. Other successes, Jen Easterly, CISA, three-year plan. Not perfect, a lot of good things in there. Chris Darusha, in uh, September of last year, issued a proclamation, shall we say. It's not been fully enacted yet, so it's on its way to guard coding in the government. What a great tool to have. And when it's fully implemented, we will all benefit from it. In addition, we've had the National Security Strategy issued in March, officially. Chris Inglis left two weeks before it being issued, so Kemba could take full credit and move forward with implementation. Another victory. Ann Newberger advising the president on a daily day basis, Rob Joyce, NSA Cyber Director, all people we can depend on, and innovative thinking across the domain when you have principal cyber advisors to our secretaries. In Michael Selmeyer, who I do not know well, but I count upon two of my good friends being Wanda Jones Heath at the Air Force, and of course, the extraordinary Chris Cleary, who I've known for over a decade. He's a favorite person of mine, and I will tell you that, who is this principal cyber advisor name. So there's some victories. What is left? And what else do we have to do? We're going to open the door up for questions, but first, let my esteemed panel introduce themselves briefly and make some opening remarks. We have three great Americans with us today, and I have the privilege of calling each of them my friend. First, we have by rank Rear Admiral Scott Sanders. We have also Colonel Craig Miller, currently serving, who runs the NSA's Air Force. He calls it something else fancy, but I call it the NSA's Air Force. <laughs> and Lieutenant Colonel, retired, John Quick, Quick West Point grad, grad, grad 84, works in the intel community, and I can't say he's not here officially, but he does work somewhere nearby. So, on that note, Admiral, you want to briefly introduce yourself and make some opening remarks? Sure, and I am not a cyber person. But I think it goes to the future of what we do here. So, I'm a Navy carrier pilot, but... <clears throat> Back in the day, I had a couple awesome jobs. I was a vice commander of NAVSENT in the Mideast, in Bahrain. And there's a lot of things going on in 2007 to 2010. And I would have to come back. If anybody knows Jan Tai or who she was, she she was in this weird, intel kind of community in the Navy. She says, hey, Scott, if you come back to Fort Meade and help me out, I said, why would I want to go to an Army base? Uh, when it come, I said, okay, Jan, I'll be. and then once I got there, I said, okay, I got it. And so uh, understood, and what she did for me, because uh, most people, when you're on the Title X side, you don't need to know all the inside stuff. 
but you need to know how to request it. <laughs> and so the, the key is to know what to request. So I, I became pretty proficient at, at knowing what to request from that place in uh, Columbia, Maryland. And so uh, but that's, that's where we kind of started there. I, uh, I ended up uh, doing, I ran the Counter Piracy Task Force off Somalia for six months, which was a little interesting because it's international, and I got to meet a lot of international. I've been on Chinese warships, we talked. And uh, you know this because I have a bourbon and stuff. I used to hand out bourbon. And so I was extremely popular in the Gulf of Aden for six months. And they, uh, people asked me, well, what did the China say? Listen, they're, they're kind of good, but they're not that good. I said, no, they've had 10 years on it. And, uh, and if you heard General Alexander this morning, they're pretty darn good and they're aggressive and they're coming after us. And a few years later, I did work for General Alexander up here. When I was, so I told people I got fired. Navy officers, when you get fired, you go to the Joint Staff. That's what happens to you. So you can say hua three or four times a day. But the point is, what where do we need to go? We need to broaden what what we need to capture is not just you know the Uber cyber people like this person here. We need to get a broad force and be rethinking sometime how we get that down. So with that turn of you, you bet, you bet. Thanks. Thanks for yeah, and thanks both for the uh, uh, introduction. My my boss, Lieutenant General Kennedy, would tell you that he is in fact the NSA's component for, as the service cryptologic component for uh, uh, for the Air Force and NSA. I am lucky enough to command currently the 70th ISR wing, of which we have a few members in the uh, the audience, which is a part of that component. But it's a uh, uh, after 15 years in the soft community, I came back uh, working SIG and support forum. I came back to NSA working up at NSA Alaska. Um, and the Russian mission there, um, and then uh, coming down to the fort uh, to be able to, to look kind of holistically. And I think that's really the important thing is to look at this for this panel from kind of the operational and strategic level, right? And you heard it a couple of times today, right, that our, from General Alexander and others, that our adversaries are at war, right? We have a problem of language in the, uh, in the U.S. military, right? We want to talk about competition, we want to talk about crisis, and we want to talk about uh, conflict and we want to escalate up to that but the truth is from my perspective that we are we are already at war just read the Chinese doctrine of unrestricted warfare it's a great book by two Chinese colonels it's about 140 pages you can get it on Amazon I highly recommend you take take a look at that because they they look in that in that piece to fight in a war without rules right or so if you like uh, if you prefer to get the audio book you can get Spalding's uh, war without rules and it's a it's a good look at the philosophy of how the Chinese have been able to pursue us after the last 20 years. And, you know, the theme of this uh, conference is a little bit to look at the history as well. I would tell you, I think we are in 1993 in the War on Terror, right after the first um, uh, dropping or the first bombing of the World Trade Center. Right. 9-11 is out there. We just don't know where it is. It will come more rapidly. But if you come at the definition of war from the American perspective, you're not going to think we're at war until there are boats moving across the Taiwan Straits. Uh, and that is problematic. That's a four hour math problem. I'm not a sailor, but I hear it takes about 20 knots to get across 80 miles of the Taiwan Straits. Um, I would tell you, we probably have about 20 hours uh, to figure, or sorry, 20 months, maybe a little bit longer uh, to figure out how we're going to engage to stop that, right? General Minahan uh, from Air, Mo Air Mobility Command Put, put out a letter which uh, got him a little bit of press coverage about uh, war in 2025. Maybe that's right, maybe that's a couple years early, but the problem is how we define war. The Chinese are already at war with us. And in this, the cyber domain, we have some victories, we have some losses, we need to be able to have more victories. So, so uh, good afternoon everybody, I'm John Quigg. Uh, I was a lifetime military intelligence guy Late in my career, I transitioned over to cyber, and uh, I was the uh, the last tech director at JTFGNO, uh, Global Network Ops, as we formed up Cyber Command. So I got to see how it all came together, or didn't, uh, and have constant, have had an ability to see it ever since inception. 
and to figure out how how we are fighting, how we could be fighting, and where some of the gaps are. So the two things I'd get after are, one, um, when it does happen, uh, they're, they're not just going to hit us. They're going to hit our bank accounts. They're going to hit our mortgages. They're going to hit power, light, et cetera. Uh, what we saw with Colonial Pipeline was just a small, small taste. And they have the capability to really reach out and hurt us, but I think they're keeping dry powder for when things go crazy. So if you're a network defender, anybody? Okay, a couple of us. I consider myself more of a network defender. Uh, you know, we do 85% of the blocking and tackling. As we stood up Cyber, Cyber Commander, I had the privilege of being in the room with Nakasone, Tag, um, and TJ White. Uh, Easterly and I were serving coffee. Um, but, <laughs> but talking to Alexander about the need to think DCO as I showed up in the short yellow bus of network defense. Uh, I think we've given a short shrift to this point. Uh, I think we're going to regret that if we don't change that perspective. And so that fits into the overarching mission threads of uh, what happens if we go into China? Are we doing the right thing with mission engineering to say, okay, what are our responses? And not just within the military, touching our, our brethren over the DHS, NORTHCOM, all the way down to state and local level. I don't think we've achieved that level of visibility. And when you've got troops deployed and their houses are being closed on because the mortgage hasn't been paid, that's going to be a huge distractor. Uh, so that's... One thinking asynchronously, uh, as the Colonel was saying, about how we're going to how we're going to fight this next war, which we're already fighting, and then the other is human capital. Uh, we have to be aggressive about going out and figuring out how we're going to flex come time of war, and it's not going to happen in the uniformed services. We got to figure out how to get reservists involved. We got to figure out how to get uh, uh, on call forces, even at the state and local level, when the water system goes out. So that'd be my challenge for us to discuss. How do we get talent on the ground as needed and scale up rapidly? So what I've heard is uh, from Scott, it's a full scale, you know, 360 degree approach to the problem. You've got a more tactical vision and you're focused on the workforce issue and the fact that, you know, we may deploy, but currently to put it in perspective, there are units that we are deploying that have less than 50% of their cyber capacity installed and we're making up the numbers with contractors to meet our minimums. And that is pretty standard fare. And when you look at that strategy, the long-term effect is a continual increase in the cost, which in essence is gonna bankrupt us because we won't be able to have enough people to defend our walls. So how are we gonna take that on? And I, I wanna throw another little piece into this puzzle because from a technical standpoint, if we ignore it, uh, we may have the people, but then we don't have the technology to compete. So AI and quantum, I'm happy to go on either bus, but I think the short bus of quantum is where we should start, and then the bigger bus of AI is where we want to continue. So anybody want to jump on that bus and give me some thoughts on how we're going to, how we're handling it, and, and what's the vision? Yeah, I'll talk quantum real quick. So, uh, one of the, so just in the arc of my career, one of the places I landed was uh, I was a tech director in the White House IT staff uh, back in 2019 and 20. And uh, we started asking what happens if quantum hap if quantum happens. Uh, and it's getting nearer and nearer. I, I've always felt that quantum's three years away and will stay that way. But I think we're starting to get to the point where it's nascent. Uh, and it's, it's, we're hardening up the crypto space now. I, I, I'm not going to say it's not going to be a problem, especially at the tactical level, if we're worried about securing uh, tactical comps. But any public key that's out there that's been transmitted in the past becomes almost trivial to break. And I don't know that we've done a risk analysis of what happens when all those stored comps are now open for reading. And I, I think that there's, uh, before crypto protection or before quantum protection, risk assessment that has to be done, and then the pace at which we can identify our treasures and get them crypto hardened for, for quantum, uh, and then how we get that down uh, all the way down to tactical radios. Uh, so that's my two cents. Or will we be communicating with drums and smoke? You know, there's something to be said for that, though. Yeah, I know there is. That's why it's Also said. using not I've heard that it's like <laughs> we're also using certain types of radio that we haven't even used in 100 years. 
<laughs> That's the Navy. <laughs> Phil, if I'm going to talk about uh, AI for a second. Yep, let's go to AI. Yep. Big bus. We're at war today. Yep. yep. It's just not recognized. Yep. And widely dispersed. Uh, Anybody using AI here, don't lie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, here's what our adversary is doing with AI today. They're using that on our population. Yeah. It's called and talk. So <laughs> when they, uh, you laugh, but they don't. Yeah. yeah. So the uh, but what scares the Chinese more than the U.S. military, which really gets them nervous, is what they saw at the beginning of the Ukraine war. When Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Starbucks pulled out of Russia. So that's how we brought our scale. There aren't enough people in this room to defend us. It's over. But if we get, if it's if people recognize that it's it's a dictatorship over there. She is a one-man person. And and nobody, he doesn't listen to a lot of people. And there are people in camps, they're controlling those populations, but nobody, they don't talk about this, you know, here. If that, if that gets more exposure, and especially if they do something into Taiwan, they're gonna, they're gonna hit us first. You know, we're not gonna be able to go to Starbucks and use our credit card. We're not gonna be able to gas up. We're gonna have a lot more problems, and they're hoping that is gonna mask all the things that they're doing over there. But if that can be preempted by not just U.S. citizens, but world, when you get other corporations pull it out, that gets the Chinese, that gets their attention. And that's much more powerful than having everybody in this room working on network defense. Yeah, no, I agree with you, Scott. I think, you know, the, the narrative uh, that we often talk about on, is that, you know, we are not in conflict at, at war with the Chinese people. It is the Chinese Communist Party, which is a very small percentage. And owning the narrative and getting message into the larger Chinese population uh, is so important. And the business strategy of it is so important. You know, growing up in the you know post 9/11 JSOC world, right? It was we talked about it being a whole of government uh, apparatus. But the truth is, it's very yeah. really back. It's a whole of nation approach, right? And you know, you talk about. Uh, TikTok, John, in Montana just yesterday, I think it was, right? Outlawed TikTok in Montana, right? So it's state and local governments have the opportunity to make changes ahead of where perhaps the federal government is um, to, to push back on that. And I think commerce is absolutely important. You know, you can love or hate Palantir, but I love what Alex Karp talks about, that if you're doing business in China, you have to think of the, the CEO of Palantir, if you're not familiar, right? He talks about if you're doing business in China as a U.S. company or an allied company, you need to think about why you're there. And I think in our tech industry, particularly, we need to think about what that looks like. Uh, you know, our while we're not necessarily the leaders in hardware, I would still argue that we are the leaders in software production uh, and capability. And that's where I think the AI, the AI approach is going to be so important. How we can rapidly over the next three to five years use you know, large language model AI to help us in producing better software. And what does that mean? Like? So, so yeah. I'm good. I'm so you're not going to pivot. Are you? I'm not. No, I'm not pivoting. I'm uh, going to okay. push back. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not pushing back. All right. I I, I like so uh, I yeah. I've got most of a doctorate right, and uh, my thesis. ABD is what we call that. Yeah, I'm ABD, <laughs> and uh, I was an NSA scholar, and uh, my thesis was on people, not on hardware, which kind of fried my department's brain, and. Uh, to your point, we are leaders, and we're leaders in hardware. I mean, we produce the best chips, the fastest chips in the world. Um, we just don't produce enough of them. We, yeah, well, we don't do it at scale. Right. Uh, yeah. But the people, so when I was at George Mason, uh, the Center of Excellence, about 20% of my class was from America, 50% of the class was from China, and 30% of the class was from places we were likely to go into conflict with. I'm looking around, I'm going, why are we training all this human capital and not capturing it? Because they're getting sent home after the degree. Not only that, they're working for thesis advisors who let them keep the passwords to all the data. And uh, you know, I was working in high performance computing for a while, and uh, we were finding, uh, uh, even in Department of Commerce, Department of Energy, there were researchers logging in from China to do work nominally for their thesis advisor, but also doing it for the big machine over in the PRC. 
I, I don't think we've approached the human capital problem with any seriousness at all. Uh, and that's that's disturbing. So we've now gone from the little bus to the big bus to the sure, yeah, okay. jumbo bus, jumbo jet. Yeah. The real issue here is human capital, is that what you're saying? I'm getting serious about it. Getting so before we get into human capital, uh, since we have, I set myself a sort of timeline to open up for questions. Open it, the questions up to the audience. Do you have any questions you would like to ask us about this issue, the future, AI, um, and uh, the, the issues that we're facing with quantum, or the general problem we face in, in, in cyber and preparing for what we need? Yeah, sure. I mean, so I can ask a question. Um, so I, I think as I listen to this conversation, it feels like the paradigm is going to shift. I mean, you know, AI is going to create equal issues on both sides, offensive and defensive capabilities, and it's just going to escalate the quantum capability will determine who can do it faster, who can rotate faster and attack faster and defend faster. But then ultimately, we know these problems, and then recently Elon Musk said, let's take a, let's have a holiday, let's stop and, and, and change our mindset to how we operate. Not only our country has an operating system, and, and and that operating system, I guess, is the is is the you know the um, the, the constitution, and which which ultimately informs who we are, and who we are is how we operate our country. So then, if that's being exploited today, you know, through TikToks and other things, how do we address that at scale? Because otherwise, it feels like we'll end up in a stalemate. With extreme force. <laughs> <laughs> so, can I, can I take that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. That's why we're here. First, I think, you know, I think Musk is, he's behind the power curve and he's trying to uh, get yeah. XI, yeah. XAI um, to, pop, to, to pop up. And he'd love everybody else to take a pause so that he could do that. I think if you pull back all the way to Steve Jobs, you know, uh, before he left for Next, he talked about that philosophically, we are not keeping up with technology, mm -hmm. right? And I think big because you know this will go way too big, but the, philosophically, I think this the human capital where we really have the winning you know uh, approach is in our philosophy about how we govern in that overarching operating system. Which I'm going to steal that from you, by the way. I really like the way you use that, and that's that is our that is actually our coin of the realm, right? And so we have to. We in forums like this and elsewhere have to talk about the civil liberties discussion, about the privacy discussion, about what does that look like, and about the fact that we are the good, the good guys in this situation, right? We are the ones that, you know, so I work, you know, National Security Agency, right? We do a lot of things that look a lot like hacking, right? But we do it under authorities and with compliance and governance and under the, you know, the laws of our nation. And that's what makes us different than an autocracy. And I think, regardless of the the you know the ever growing war on AI being good or bad, we have to remember that operating system. But I don't think you know I think Elon would love a pause, but we're not. He's not going to get one on Twitter, <laughs> and he's not going to get one in AI for sure. But anyway, what's yeah. worth? I would say we have a problem. Correct. <laughs> Correct. 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 Sir. Yeah, I want to talk about the issue about human capital. Yep. I wanted to hear your guys. Can you give us your name and oh, details a little bit? Chief Skeleton from part of the Army. Fabulous. Um, we're talking about human capital as a problem we're having here. And a lot of times we don't talk about what the Colonel was talking about legislation and authority that sometimes hamper the ability to build human capital. Like, for instance, the Reserve National Guard, uh, sometimes uh, we heard uh, Admiral Montgomery in the conversation about how understaffed DHS is, how the National Guard can sometimes reserve and fill that role. Well, because of title and legislation in the 1800s are hampering and preventing us from being able to help. I was interested to hear from you guys and uh, Bruce talking about how a lot of our adversaries don't play fair and uh, what that looks like in the future for us. Yeah, so you know, the Chinese have a cyber warrior program. Last year, last July, they graduated about 20,000 students in their first class. <laughs> That's what we're facing. And they have a massive facility about as big as the Pentagon training all those people. I hope so, you're not wanting us to help you feel th better. This is <laughs> th you, you are you are you are you are spot on. And what we need to do, at, you know, we need to talk to our political leaders wherever we are, um, whatever state you live in, whatever congressional district you live in, and we need to. So one of the key things that is absolutely true about our industry is that our private sector in this industry doesn't really understand what they do. 
right? They think they're defending against Fuzzy Bear, Cozy Bear, whatever the hell the Russian guy is, right? We are. They aren't. They're facilitating commerce. And a tiny little bit of what they do is actually in data, pure data protection against nation states. But we've got to change the discussion in our private sector so that they understand they defend the data so that commerce can happen. We defend the data so the nation can be safe. And largely, there are very two different avenues. But you go to RSA and you ask people at RSA what they do. That's a big cyber conference in San Francisco. If you haven't been there, I, I can understand. I don't like to go. I have to go occasionally. And let me tell you, you go from booth to booth, they have no idea what business they're actually in. They are the facilitator of commerce so that our administrative costs and distribution costs and all things associated with it over the last 20 years have been magnificently reduced because of cybersecurity protection of the data. Now, on the other side of the hand, we defend the nation. So we have to change the dialogue, and we have to make sure people understand their roles in the mission. Now, that doesn't mean in that role in the mission there aren't critical hotspots. So on my list of things I just wanted to tell you about, moving to a slightly different topic, because we only got five minutes, I wanted people to be aware. I host on a weekly basis a cyber gathering called the National Security and Cyber WeDram. It span out of the Joint Services Academy Cyber Summit three years ago. We meet every week on Wednesday at 5.30. Scott and I co-host it. We have 600 odd members, about 70 people meet each week. We had Matt Noyes, who is the CIO over at the Secret Service. And Matt, shockingly, I'm pretty up to date on stuff, gave some numbers on how our senior citizens are being attacked. And it is staggering. And yet, in our national security policy for the nation, there's no segment that addresses that. Yet it is, a, it is huge. So there are all these key components that are missing. Now, I'm not saying the cyber strategy isn't basically a good directional framework and document. What I am saying, we as a community need to be clear on our roles, okay? And we need to also know what the mission actually is. So when we go out to the marketplace and we communicate, we've got to inform. So, gentlemen, any comments on that? Yeah, Chief, if I could pivot off a little bit with Philip saying, I think to maybe get closer in on the Guard Reserve portion of yeah. the legislation change. I think, you know, what we, our problem is across the U.S. government that we believe in linear career paths, right? And so you don't get to be General Nakasone without being Second Lieutenant Nakasone, right? And you have to be continually in that same space. The talent that we need needs to be able to be fluid across both sides from being governmental side to private industry to back to and back and forth and, and I include in that state government right as well and law enforcement you know and this is a place where the guard and reserve can be really helpful if we create the right and it, it, it would take legislation to do it to change the the titles under which the guard and reserve can can operate regardless of the type of orders that they are on and to be able to pull them in I think you know and I would just to kind of put a stretch goal out there that I've talked about with a couple of the folks up here on the panel I think we need to do the same thing in government civilian service, right? If I was king for a day, which is a wing commander, you never are. Um, I would, I would take the senior executive service, and I would require it to be a three-year appointment. And you could recompete at the three-year point, but only 50% of you would be selected. Because if we're truly going to bring in talent out of Boston or Silicon Valley or Austin or right here in the local cybersecurity uh, industry. We've got to give them an opportunity to serve for, for a set period of time, let's call it three years, and then go back uh, to, their, uh, uh, to, their, to their private sector jobs. And that would work in the cross flow of information, right? The tools, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that we generate on, side, on the military side and the governmental side are good, and they're, but there are great tactics, techniques, and procedures being generated by the private sector. And we're not getting enough cross flow in that. And again, I go back to this is a whole of nation problem, right? And so I think the Guard and Reserve, if we crafted the legislation right, would be a place where we can push and pull that, right? I think the Maryland governor would be super excited to have more cyber warriors than to have more C-130s, right? You know, that's that's a place that, or actually, I guess he's got F-16s, right? So uh, that that's you know that those are going to be worthless on day two. So that's that would be a place that I... So, so, so sadly, I'm getting the two fingers, which means something in Britain, but not here. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, you know, half Scottish, half American. Scottish island mother, American father, who did two tours, Second World War, Korea, just for a short note. Great man, loved the American army. 
Uh, closing comments, be brief, gentlemen. I have a couple of remarks. You know, I'm going to just mention on AI. Um, they're using it, but when you have a controlling central government, most of what they're using it for is against their own people. And what yeah. we're using it for is defending our people. So, got a lot of people, they're using it against their own people. Education and training is the key, and we have to push it farther left. Uh, right? During the Cold War, we our goal was to teach everybody calculus when they were in high school and college. Why? Because we wanted to build rockets, because Sputnik scared us and we needed to get to the moon. Right? We need to push, and Cyber Patriot's a great effort, but it needs to be uh, jumped scaled, up, scaled ten, ten times, times at least. Maybe a hundred. I need third graders to be thinking about cybersecurity from there forward, and I need everybody that, that graduates high school to have a basic level of understanding about cybersecurity, both offensive and defensive. Right, that's the key. Well, uh, in my in my stint as a uh, as a banker, I was going around a lot of technology companies and seeing all the former troops that I'd worked with at NSA and in the service uh, service uh, cyber commands uh, that had started their businesses. And I I asked one kid who'd gotten out of B two. I said, "Who the hell's left?" He said, "Oh, we all split, started our own companies." So this is where I see the guard and reserve as critical. These people are all patriots. They'd love to help as necessary when necessary, but we just don't pay. Yep. So that's that's something that really needs an innovative one. Yes. Here's the message to take home. Inspire participation in our industry by explaining what we do. You defend the nation. Tell people, I defend the nation. This is how we do it. Make it in simple terms. Let's make me take our the core of the cyber defending principles down to easily understandable terms. Let's be more inclusive. Our industry is far too one color and is far too representative of the male uh, species. And there's no reason that it should be the case. My grandfather who built ships had rooms full of, of, of ladies who did all of his calculations for him, hundreds of them. Yet we don't have 21% Women are, make up 21% of the federal cyber workforce, 47% of the overall workforce. That's a ridiculous number. So inspire, participate, reach out to people who don't know and understand our industry, and take this passion which you obviously have for this great industry that we share and share it with your community. That will be the difference maker. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here today.